Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. John Kachuba back with us now, author, paranormal investigator. He is a certified ghost hunter. He has investigated a number of haunted locations. He is a frequent guest on radio, television, and a noted speaker at paranormal conferences. He has also written books unrelated to the paranormal, but teaches creative writing at Ohio State University, Ohio University. He lives in Cincinnati, Ohio, one of America's most haunted towns. A couple of his books include Ghost Hunters and then Shapeshifters. John, welcome back. How are you? Uh, thanks, George. It's good to be back. How did John Kachuba get involved in all of this? <laughs> well, John Kachuba grew up in an area that uh, was steeped very much in in a lot of this uh, ghostly paranormal lore. You know, I grew up in New England, and uh, you know, I couldn't help but walk past some old cemetery almost any town that I lived in. And I just really got involved with the stories and the and the folklore and all that, and started thinking, I wonder if there's more to it, and just started investigating and pretty much all my life, although not really writing about it until, you know, maybe the last couple of decades. Wow, a couple of decades. Well, that's a long time. <laughs> it sure is. It goes by fast, though, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. A couple of years ago, you wrote an incredible book called Shapeshifters of History. What exactly is a shapeshifter? Well, the simple definition is, you know, it's a person that is able to transform himself into into usually an animal, but it could be another person. It could be even an inanimate object. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the general definition. And, you know, we find these characters way back in, in ancient literature. We find them back in cave paintings. And we're talking about them today in, in terms of uh, real-life encounters from some people. It, would this be a shapeshifter? I knew a person whose personality would just change at a whim and become a totally different person. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think we all know people like that. And when I talk about shapeshifters, I frequently classify them into two different ways. I talk about a voluntary shapeshifter and an involuntary. And what I mean by that is, you know, a voluntary shapeshifter is uh, the typical um, person, a, a shaman, a wizard, some of the ancient gods like the Greek gods like Zeus, who have some innate power to say, hey, I'm going to just be something different right now, and they can do it. Involuntary ones are those that, uh, you know, are, are frequently under a curse, like um, think of some of the fairy tales, like Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. right? um, the prince, uh, it's always a handsome Jack, prince, Jekyll, right? and Hyde. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that kind of thing. And I think what happens is I think there are people – um, that sort of the volunteer, the involuntary ones are more or less internal. There's internal and external too. I talk about that as well. And these are people who internal shapeshifters are those that don't ever manifest physically into something different. You know, so they don't suddenly grow fangs and hair and howl at the moon at night like a werewolf. Yet there's something inside them that has this sort of I don't want to say split personality because that's a very that's, you know, that's almost right. bi bipolarish, right? Yeah, yeah, and and certainly those you know, some of those folks do act out that way. But I'm talking about something a little bit different that we don't really know what it is. But there's an internal personality that does not match that exterior, um, and yeah, we all I think we all know some people like that. And for the most part, I think they're harmless. But every so often, you get somebody like um, like a Ted Bundy. You know what? I mean, everybody talks about Ted Bundy being this clean-cut sort of collegiate kind mm -hmm. of guy who would help you change a tire, help you bring your groceries into the house, and then He's became a demon. Killer. Yeah, yeah. So you know, there's that kind of thing going on. Are, are shapeshifters dangerous to themselves as well? That's a good question. You know, I, I really don't know. I think I think they can be. I think in some of the cases that we hear about from 
like the 16th, 17th century of lycanthropy, for instance, where people believe that they were turned into wolves. Uh, you know, you look at them physically and they weren't. However, they would act out. So they'd be scratching and tearing and growling and, you know, sometimes do harm to themselves as well uh, as other people. So I, I guess there is that component or could be that component. It's fascinating. Now, when you were doing your book, Shapeshifters, a history, how did you begin to start the research for this? Well, I mean, you don't go door to door going, do you have a shapeshifter who lives there? <laughs> Well, you know, that you could try that. I'm not sure how far you'd get, you know. People hear my dog barking in the backyard, and they think he must have a werewolf there. Exactly. So it's, it's possible. Um, no, I think uh, what I did, first of all, is I, I did a lot of reading, and I did a lot of reading into some very old books. For instance, one that I really found fascinating was called uh, A Treatise on the Apparitions of Spirits and on Vampires or Revenants. And this was written by a Benedictine monk named Augustine Calmet in 1751. And he runs the gamut of almost every kind of paranormal experience one can have with any kind of paranormal entity, but a lot about shapeshifters. Um, so I was looking at those kind of old, old manuscripts. And then it's easy to do a research, uh, do a search through newspapers and journals and things like that to look for, uh, you know, more recent reportings or sightings. And once I found some of these areas, particularly, um, I did a lot of traveling. I, I, for shapeshifters, I was in, oh my gosh, I was in France, Italy, uh, Portugal, Belarus, Ukraine, Jeez. Romania, and some countries in Asia, Cambodia, um, Indonesia, Thailand. So I did a lot of traveling for it to try to go to locations where there were stories or legends about shapeshifters and to see what was actually there on the ground. Was there any, you know, physical evidence, if you will, or, or whatever. So I, I did a lot of research for it. I guess that's the short of it. And do you find, John, that nowadays more and more people are becoming some way, and my definition of a shapeshifter is not a physical change, but a mental change. Do we, are we having more and more of those cases I don't know. I, I don't know if I can say we have more and more. Now. I think we've always had it. Um, I just don't know if it was identifiable. I think maybe it's becoming more identifiable because people are becoming more interested. It's sort of a, you know, which comes first. But I, but I think that's what you're sort of saying is that I think we're, I think our knowledge of not just shapeshifters, but of paranormal events, paranormal entities in general is becoming much more widespread. And I think more people are interested in it. So I think we're now maybe able to identify things more, more clearly and say, oh, that sounds like a shapeshifter episode, or that sounds like that could have been a werewolf sighting or, or something along those lines. What about Dracula? You, you mentioned him a little bit. We've mentioned werewolves. Would you call Dracula a pure shapeshifter? Well, it, it depends on which Dracula we're talking about. <laughs> If we're talking about the fictional Dracula, you know, or Brand TV Stoke, or the movies, yeah, 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 I would say yeah. Although he seems to, in, in most of the movies, he seems to restrict himself to the form of a bat, which Bram Stoker does mention. You know, he does have that transformation of Count Dracula into a bat in his novel Dracula. Um, but you know, the real life Dracula, or who we think maybe sort of who Dracula was modeled on, was. Vlad the Impaler, you know, a prince in uh, Wallachia in the 16th century in Romania, uh, Transylvania, actually, particularly. And, uh, you know, he was not a shapeshifter. He was a pretty ruthless prince that you know, executed thousands of people. Um, but I have to say, probably not more ruthless or bloodthirsty than most medieval princes of his time. Rick. And shapeshifting doesn't necessarily mean evil or bad, does it? No, not at all. I and mean, that's the thing. Shapeshifters have a connotation because of, of Superman was a shapeshifter. Oh, yeah, there you go. Exactly. He was. And actually that's interesting. There's a lot of sort of, you know, Marvel comic heroes and Batman comic heroes. Yeah. Right. Almost any of the superheroes are have some kind of an incognito disguise, mm -hmm. right, as a human. And yet they have these miraculous powers. Look at the Hulk. I mean, the poor guy is just a you know a normal being, and all of a sudden turns into this you know gigantic green green monster machine. You know. Well, you mentioned Ted Bundy, but what about people at work at your office who you know come across as 
hardworking, deliberate, and stuff. And then at night, they, uh, you know, jump on their suits and throw them off and uh, go out and have a great party. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And, you know, is that evil? Yeah, I mean, they're having a good time. So. And they're shape-shifting. And they're shape-shifting. Well, and I think, I think this is the key to shape-shifting is that I think my, the term that I, okay, when I use the term shape-shifter, I do use it very broadly. I do certainly talk about the classical shapeshifters that we've sort of talking about. Right, you've here. even talked about alien shapeshifters. Exactly, we'll get into that. exactly. Uh, the David Ike, Ike kind of things, the reptilian alien shapeshifters. Um, but I also think that the, the whole idea of the shapeshifter, I think the whole reason why the character of the shapeshifter is so appealing to us is because I think all of us sometime in our life, say, you know, we say, boy, I wish I was stronger. I wish I was better looking. I wish I was smarter. I wish I was, you know, fill in the blank. We all sort of have that, right? I mean, all of us have some little insecurity in our lives, maybe not all the time, but once in a while. And so I think the shapeshifter offers us kind of that... Um, a way out. Yeah, vicariously, right? I mean, you say, wow, you know, if I can be Superman, you know. Don't we shapeshift on Halloween? I was just going to say, it's part of Halloween. That's what Halloween is about in a lot of ways, right? I mean, how do you decide on the costume you're going to wear? There's some psychological process going on in your head that says, I want to be Superman. And I have seen people become that costume mm-hmm. when they Cost shapeshift. Players. I mean, their hope, their personality changes. They're having a good time. But, I mean, they're into it. It's, yeah. like, it's like an acting role. Yeah. But they do shapeshift like that. Well, for part of my research, I went to some of these uh, cosplay conventions, you know, and, and cosplay for your audience, they probably do know, but it's short for costume play, literally meaning that you dress up as a character and you don't just dress up. Like you say, George, you get into that role. So if the, if the character that you're impersonating uh, speaks with a Scottish accent, well, you speak with a Scottish accent. Some of, you know, if that character eats nothing but Cheerios every morning, you eat Cheerios every morning. I mean, you get into the role just like actors. And I think actors are shapeshifters, too, in some way, because they do get into that role. Yeah. No, there's no, the good actors are. Yes, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. What got you interested in this? In, in shapeshifters particularly? Yeah. Well, I mean, because you've you know, been a ghost hunter for yeah, years. Right. Right. And I'm still, you know, I'm still doing the, the paranormal stuff with the ghosts and everything, too. But I think what happened is that um, I, I do a lot of public appearances. I do a lot of programs like yours. And, and so people hear me. And as I'm speaking about ghosts and speaking to my audiences, frequently people would relate their ghost stories to me. And sometimes the stories that they would talk about didn't sound like a ghost. Like, well, I, I'm not sure. You know, they would say, well, I, you know, I saw this figure. I saw a misty figure, and then suddenly it was gone, and there was something else in its place, or I saw it sort of metamorphose into something. And so I think, well, I'm hearing a lot about what sounds like shapeshifters. So I just started doing some research on, on their prevalence, on cultures that have shapeshifter characters and everything, and the world just opened up in terms of shapeshifters. I mean, it was, it was amazing. I, I don't know how many, I, I probably have a couple of different hundreds, uh, different kinds of shapeshifters mentioned in the book, you know, uh, and really a lot of them just mentioned because there are so many. Every culture, every culture in the world seems to have some shapeshifter character. In it. Uh, absolutely. And uh, sometimes they're tied to religions, sometimes they're not. Right, right, exactly. Have you ever met a human shapeshifter? Well, you know, um, that's a good question. I, I don't know that I've, I don't know that I've met one personally, but I know that uh, I've spoken to uh, some <laughs> or or people that have, that have said they have shape shifted. Uh, and alcohol will shape shift you. It, it will, yeah. Probably not in a good way. I've seen that happen a lot. Yeah. There's and and there's a lot of things that will will do that. I just got finished. This is a little bit off the idea of shape. Well, not off shape shifting, but an explanation, perhaps, of what happens. I just got finished reading a novel in which the character uh, developed rabies. And, you know, rabies is an incredibly awful disease to have. If you, if symptoms appear before you can get treatment, you're in bad you're shape. Die. You're in bad yeah. shape. You're, you're you start die. foaming and everything else. Yeah. And so when you read some of these accounts, there's something actually called furious rabies. Um, furious. 
And what happens is, you know, as you can imagine, people that unfortunately suffer from that, they're hyperactive, they hypersalivate, they have agitation, sometimes, uh, you know, sort of back and forth between being agitated and having some lucidity, but they have delirium, they have abnormal behavior, frequently violent, hallucinations, confusion. I think that a lot of what we talked about in the past, you know, a couple hundred years ago as being shapeshifters or being werewolves particularly, could have been people that were infected with rabies. Um, I mean, I, I think that was, you know, there certainly was no treatment a couple hundred years ago for, for rabies. If you got it, you got it. Uh, and people didn't understand the nature of that disease. And so was that a shapeshifter? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, it certainly would seem to be, to the average person, you would say this guy is just transformed into a, ra- a raving beast, a werewolf. Where do people get your book on shapeshifting? They can get it any place. <laughs> well, it's hopefully still in the bookstores, um, but they can also get it on Amazon and any of the online vendors, Barnes & Noble, any of those people have it. But um, it is available uh, through my website as well, johnkachuba.com. But right. also, like I said, it's it's still in a lot of the bookstores and libraries. And- John, as we talk about these shapeshifters, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Are they mentally ill? Well, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think that certainly people have mental illnesses that make them think differently about who they are or, or what they are. Um, but that's not what I really talk about in my book. I really talk about sort of the classical shapeshifter that is, is not related to mental illness. It's just we don't know what it is, but it's not related to mental illness, um, especially when you look at some of the old legends and tales and things like that from the various cultures that I write about. They're not talking about people that are ill. They're just talking about people that have power um, or that are under, I would say, under stress from another power, like a curse or something along those lines, but not really mental illness. Hmm. Interesting take. And uh, it's just a bizarre field. Are other countries got the same kind of shape-shifting problems that we do? Well... I don't know what shape-shifting problems we have. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I don't see any, any problem with having a shapeshifter unless we're talking again about people like, like Ted Bundy and things like that. But that, to me, is probably more a psychological issue than true shape-shifting. Um, but, I, but I think the idea of the shapeshifter itself generally is that it, it's a universal character and the various traits of just getting out of yourself and becoming something other than what you are originally um, is, is universal. And I think it appears in every culture. Uh, it manifests maybe differently depending on the cultures, you know, uh, mores and, and how they live. But the basic element of just transforming out of yourself is something that is, is universal across all cultures. Do you think that shapeshifters can actually physically change I personally don't believe that, but there's, you know, there are stories and not just stories, but I mean like news reports, like from the New York Times and things about people witnessing um, what they say are actually shape-shifting events. Um, And New York Times, you know, there was a reporter up there that reported on this and went there and said that, well, this is what the people are saying. Uh, This is what they're seeing. I don't know if the reporter saw anything. But so, I mean, there are incidents like that where we, where we have these things. There's reports from Africa, you know, and some other countries, uh, e- England, about werewolf sightings, uh, but not just a sighting, but seeing a transformation, you know. So I'm, I'm in no position to say that it, it doesn't happen. I, you know, I, I don't, I personally find it a little hard to believe that we can actually change our physical form like that. I think we can change our mental outlook. I think we can make ourselves believe that we've become things. Um, physically, I, I find that a stretch. Uh, yet, as I said, there are people that have seen that and will, you know, would call me uh, you know, ignorant because they've seen it. They've witnessed it. A caterpillar is a shapeshifter. Well, yeah, exactly it is. I mean, that's the thing. It's in, you know, we see it in nature, too. There's the metamorphosis of so many things, especially in the insect world, right? Caterpillar becomes a butterfly. So, Exactly. 
Well, thank, thank good, uh, good, good. Thank, thank God that he didn't turn all of us into physical shapeshifters. <laughs> yeah, it'd be problems. But you know, I, there was a guy that I, I spoke to here in Ohio named Guy Savelli. A guy named Guy. It makes it really easy. Yeah. But uh, Guy Savelli, there was a there was a book that came out. Um, I don't have the title maybe exactly, but something like Men That Stare at Goats or Men That Look at Goats. And there was a movie made from that. Yes, there was. That's yeah, right. and what it was about was about this sort of a covert um, operation that the military was doing where they were training people. Remote viewing, right? Right, remote viewing and to be able to do something with the power of their minds. And Guy Savelli lives in Ohio. He was a guy, he's a martial arts expert and everything else. And he worked with Navy SEALs, he worked with CIA, he worked with a lot of people on sort of mind control stuff, and he was part of this whole project. Now, if you asked him about shapeshifters, um, I don't think he would call himself a shapeshifter, but in one of his students related, one of his martial arts students related an incident where he and Guy were in a bar, and uh, some guy was drunk and just came up to the two of them and just got into Guy Savelli's face and was just, you know, harassing him and everything else. And Savelli just stood back and said, hey, you know, just why don't you take it outside, buddy? You're drunk. And the guy just kept coming at him. He was belligerent. So all of a sudden, the student, Savelli's student, said that, I don't know what happened. He said, but I looked at Guy, and, and something happened to Guy's face. He said, I don't know how to describe it other wow. than I saw the face of a tiger. Remember the Eye of a Tiger movie and all that kind of stuff in the song? Mm-hmm. But he said, he said Savelli's face was like a tiger. And he said that the, this drunk who was going to come at him just suddenly stopped and just like turned pale and just backed turned off. around and walked away and backed yeah. off. And then the guy and the student said, that was it? It lasted like two seconds. And, you know, Savelli just said something like, well, it's, it's all mind control. You know? but, but there was, to me, that's like a shape-shifting incident. You know, I don't think Guy would call himself a shapeshifter. But what do you? What, would, what else would you call that? You, you'd <laughs> have to. Have you know, to. I mean, he didn't grow claws and fur, but there was something in him. He he was able to manifest some some face, some image that you know terrified this drunk and told him to back off because he's dealing with something that he doesn't know what he's dealing with right now. So uh, you know, you asked before about the guy if I knew it. I said, well, I don't know if I would call him a shapeshifter or not, but I think it kind of falls into that classification. I had John Ronson on my show years ago who wrote the book, The Men Who Stare at Goats. Oh, okay. They turned the movie into. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. It really is. Can people practice to become shapeshifters? Or, so. or, or does it come naturally? No, I, I think, you know, I, I, you read a lot about um, people, especially in, in the East and the Far East, you know, in places like Tibet and Nepal and places like this, where, where people meditate, you know, monks especially or religious people meditate for years and years and years. And you often hear that they have, like, like I mentioned earlier about the Buddha having a transfiguration or Jesus having a transfiguration. I mean, both those people were very spiritual, very deep into meditation and spiritual life, right? I mean, they, they were. And they were able to make these kinds of transformations. So I think it can happen. Um, just as like you hear about, uh, especially again, back in uh, those areas, in the in Asian areas, uh, where some monks can meditate for years and years on a particular object, a mental image, and create it, actually create it into reality. And they call that a tulpa. You know, so, you know, if they can do that, <laughs> if they can bring a mental image into life, into reality, uh, I think they're probably able to, you know, change them themselves into something different as well. How far back, John, does the folklore of shape-shifting go? Well, the folklore, you know, obviously goes back to you know, oral tales way before anything was even written down. But there was evidence. There's a, a, a cave painting in France that dates back from the Neolithic period, which was, you know, far before folk tales or anything. And it shows what anthropologists and archaeologists think is a, is a shaman uh, transforming into a deer. It's clearly a human being standing on his, you know, on his legs, yet his hands and feet have been transformed into uh, not sort of hooves, but yet with fingers and toes. And he's got antlers, you know? Um, so they go back 
the Neolithic times, and this is supposedly evidence of like maybe the first shapeshifter or shamanic magic that would make uh, the shaman believe that he had transformed into um, you know an animal. So it goes way back. It goes way back before anything was even written down and before people were even telling tales around campfires. And it just continued to fester, didn't it? Well, <laughs> yeah, fester is one way, yeah. Or develop, you know, depending on your point of view, right? But, um, yeah, and and today we have, uh, you know, a whole, whole story about shapeshifters. It's become a whole culture. It, the shapeshifter character has infused itself into our culture in so many different ways. Uh, there's products. I, I was it, it, the publisher for my book, Shapeshifters. I had a whole chapter in the back, the last chapter, which was about literally products that had some connection to a shapeshifter. For instance, there's a a beer out of uh, Great Britain, out of England, that's called Shapeshifter, and it's got a painting of, uh, or it's got an image of the Loch Ness monster on mm-hmm. it. Which I'm not sure it's a shapeshifter, but there's that. There's cartoons. You know my. One of my little granddaughters, five years old, told me about a cartoon show she was watching called Morphol, M-O-R-P-H-O-L, yeah, as yeah. in like morpho- morphology and morphological. And Morphol, Morphol is this little red gumdrop character that can change in, in will into anything that it wants. It's a shapeshifter. Uh, so it's, it's all over the place. Um, and it's amazing. I wrote the whole chapter, and then the publisher said, well, we don't want to get into it that much. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> so they dropped the chapter. But I thought it showed, it showed my point, which is that the shapeshifter has transcended from just being sort of a folkloric character into our everyday consciousness. We're not even aware of it, you know. Um, Count Chocula cereal, you know, on the store shelves. Count Chocula is Dracula. He's a shapeshifter. I mean, it, it's everywhere. Captain Kangaroo, probably you may be too young for that. Oh, no, I'm not. You remember that. He <laughs> had do. he had a cartoon character named Tom Terrific. Remember oh, yeah. him? Yes, absolutely. He was a shapeshifter. That's, that's right. I've forgotten all about him, but absolutely he was. I loved that cartoon. <laughs> he had a little <laughs> tiny funnel as a hat. He, right. he wore it upside down. Right. But whenever he wanted to, he could become a table, a chair, a, a, a part of a dog, anything he wanted. It was yeah. amazing. Right. And, and that actually, it's funny because that's that's exactly what this little morphal character is today. He's, he's a modern day Tom Terrific, you know. So, uh, yeah, I just forgot all about that, though. Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> that's a new book right there. Yeah. Tom Terrific. <laughs> the return of Tom Terrific. I can see it. Now, what what do your colleagues say? You know, you're you're still teaching at Ohio University or not? Yeah, I do. I, I'm teaching a little bit differently now. I'm not on campus. I'm now in Cincinnati, and I'm teaching in a um, a distance learning program. Like a Zoom environment? No, I wish it was. It's all, it's still paper. I mean, my students do things on paper, mail it to the office at OU, and they mail it to me, and I do revisions and everything. But my students are 90% incarcerated. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting, I, and I, I like it because I, I'm thinking that, you know, maybe I'm helping these guys find a better way, you know, to Especially when they life. get out, you know. Yeah, so Now, but, those are shapeshifters. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. I mean, and I hope they, uh, yeah. I hope they can shift in a, in a proper way. To the to the good. Yeah, exactly. So it does happen. It does go from bad to good, too, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I, I, you know, I always sort of emphasize that. that it, it seems to me that shapeshifters just get a bad rap all the time as being, you know, evil and demonic and everything else. And that's just that's just not the case. Um, you know, there's a whole there's a whole folklore in Italy of the little they're called Donias de Fuera. They um, literally means uh, sort of fire fairies or, or ladies of fire, and they're little they're little fairy people, but they're um, they're shapeshifters, uh, but they do good things. You know, they're the kind that do you favors and do things overnight mm-hmm. for you that you couldn't get done. You couldn't get your uh, you know your your field plowed. So next morning you wake up and your field has been plowed because the the shapeshifters came and did it for you. So uh, you know there, there's certainly a lot that are 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 to the good. They're not all just, you know, evil people. <laughs> Stephen King, the great writer, of course, had a quote that said, give them to me as children, and I will have them for a lifetime. What did he mean by that? Yeah, 
you know what I think he's talking about is I, I think first of all uh, horror I think uh, and monsters serve a purpose for us and I think that what happens is in a world where there's so much so much difficult things so many difficult things to deal with so many horrible things to deal with in reality that we need a release and I think monsters and, and ghosts and things like that um, provide that for us whether you're reading about them or watching movies you can vicariously you know defeat a werewolf you can vicariously kill a zombie and i think in a lot of ways by doing that it's a psychological release i, I think it helps us deal with the everyday uh, stuff that is so horrible and actually along those lines i have a novel coming out um next year which is specifically for kids age 10 to 13 and it's a paranormal novel it's called hey corn smith and the castle ghost good for and you so, yeah, so I'm trying to go that route too a little bit to, in a way, to help kids, you know, maybe in a fun way. Yeah, in a fun way. I mean, the the ghost in the story. It's a paranormal novel. Exactly. So anyway, I think that's what I think that's what Stephen King means. And so once you, as a child, once you learn how to handle that, um, it kind of stays with you, and maybe that's what. You know, you have a lifelong uh, attraction to monster movies and, and novels and things like that. I mean, that happened to me. I read all the monster magazines when I was a little kid, all the movie magazines, you know, uh, and saw all the movies. and All classics. Doing it. And we're talking with John Kachuba. His latest book is called Shapeshifters, A History. This hour will take your calls on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you with John Kachuba. John, uh, tell us more about the your haunted missions that you go on. My haunted missions? <laughs> well, most of it is, is research develop is uh, you know researching books and things like that. But um, I try to travel any place I can in terms of uh, paranormal places. I've done a lot of ghost work, primarily haunted locations. Right. Uh, most of that in the U.S., although some of that's been abroad. It's just been interesting. I mean, frequently I'll work with different paranormal investigators or paranormal teams in a particular area, and we'll go into a location and just, you know, see what's there. And I always go in as a journalist. I think that's one thing that makes my investigations a little bit different. I don't, I don't claim to uh, be, you know, clairvoyant or psychic or anything else like that, and I'm also not trying to prove anything. So I'm not trying to prove the existence of any paranormal entities. I'm also not trying to uh, debunk them. I just go in totally objective and say, okay, I'm a, I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist, I'm a writer. What's going on here? You know, and I I record whatever I observe or whatever experiences I have, but I also talk to people that are there, uh, especially at locations where somebody – you know, like a haunted hotel or something where somebody is there all the time as a desk clerk or a security guard or a housekeeper. I come in for a couple of hours or whatever. I may not experience anything, but they may have had something over a long period they're there. So that's a, that's a little bit about how I work and, and, you know, where I go. But I'm always looking for locations. I'm always interested in, in new things. Um, like Shapeshifters was kind of a departure from sure. my work with ghosts. But uh you know, it was interesting, and I'm willing to do more with that. And I don't know what else will come out of this, you know. <laughs> Have you ever been scared going to a place? Well, yeah. I mean, I think, I think I've think i certainly been um, nervous. I don't, know, I don't know about scared. Not, certainly not to the point where I said, oh, I, I can't go in here, or I can't work here, or I can't do anything here. Um, and you know what happens, George? It's interesting because when you're in a location that might be, let's say, a haunted location, for instance, um, if something does happen, something out of the ordinary, something you know paranormal, um, your first reaction isn't really to run away in fear because you're usually so startled and so so amazed that you witness something that your first reaction is, holy cow, this is awesome. Right. You know? right. It's only later on when you start thinking about it where you say, no, it's actually you know, maybe scary. But at the time, you don't feel that. Um, I know I've had incidents occur in different locations, haunted locations, and that's exactly what I felt. was just like, this is amazing. You know, that's, your, that's your first reaction. Uh, but I don't know that I've actually been in a place that was um, scary enough to the point that I, I said, well, yeah, I would never go back there again. Um, there may be locations like that, but I haven't come across them yet. John, what do you think of dowsing? Well, I'm a dowser. 
<laughs> you do that too, huh? I do, yeah. So I know you wrote uh, about dowsing, but you do that too. No, yeah, I, I do. Um, and, and what I do, I I do it for what I call just a source of energy, you know. So that's the one tool that I'll take besides a camera when I go into a location that might be haunted, and I will douse. And when I get a positive reaction, which is for me the two rods crossing over uh, like an X, um, I, I say, okay, this is an area where I'm – detecting just more energy and that's as far as i'll go is to say that there's more energy here so then i'll say that you know the team or whatever that i'm with we might want to hang out here a little bit more take some more pictures maybe run some recorders and see what happens so i do that i do it to map out you know kind of locations i was at a haunt <laughs> this is a crazy story i was at a farm an abandoned farm here in ohio that was supposed to be haunted and i went into the barn and i had my dowsing rods and I didn't know anything about the barn. I was just, you know, walking around back and forth on the floor, seeing if there was anything there. And I was getting hits. I was getting positive hits. And I noticed that I was actually sort of mapping out a rectangular area, maybe eight or ten feet by maybe four or five. And I said, that's odd. What is this? I kept mapping out this area. And then the person who... Um, knew about this farm and actually actually worked on it once before when it was still an active farm, came in and he said, uh, he saw me dowsing and he said, oh, you found the car. I said, what? <laughs> he said, you found the car. There was, there's a car buried under that floor, in the, under that dirt floor in the barn. Jeez. And apparently I located it with the dowsing rods. But the interesting question that nobody's able to answer for me is, what is a car doing buried buried in a barn? Is, is there a body? Is there a body in the trunk? <laughs> That's what I'm wondering. Is this like an Al Capone car or something? I mean, what is it? You know, and and nobody. The guy said, I don't know. I was just told there's a car under there. I said, well, doesn't anybody want to dig it up and find out what's there? You know, and apparently they don't. So, you know, let sleeping dogs lie. Maybe I I don't know. Uh, but, wow. but it was interesting. So, yeah, so what do I think about dowsing? I think um, I think there's something to it. Um, I, I've, I've done it myself. I do it. Uh, I remember the cable guy came out to our property once, and he used dowsing rods to locate underground uh, cable wires. Oh, really? Yeah, he That's had them on his truck. He came out, and I said, you're using dowsing rods. And he said, yeah. <laughs> and I knew another guy who was, uh, he was a Cherokee, and he was, well, his father was what they called a water witch which is, you know, a dowser that would look for water. Um, and he'd go out to places where people were trying to dig a well or something, and he would douse the location for a well, and sure enough, they'd strike water. Why, John, are most shapeshifter stories in Hollywood books, artistic depictions, animals and men? Um I, I'm not sure what your question is, George. Well, the, they 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 are, they always seem to shift from a person to an animal. Oh, right. Well, I mean that's that's been the tradition. You know, there's been this werewolf tradition, for instance, which is one of the sort of the quintessential um, shapeshifter. And I think a lot of that has to do with the nature of um, our relationship with canines. You know, I mean that was the first animal that mankind domesticated, and actually took a wild wolf and made it into a, a puppy that you now buy at a, a store and play with, right? So we've, we've, um, we've had a relationship there, and I think that it's, it's easy to, to think that perhaps there is some closer relationship via shape-shifting. So I think that might explain sort of the werewolf thing. And from other animals, basically, if you look at other cultures, like I mentioned the, um, the Kalahari Bushmen a little bit earlier, and they shapeshift into animals that they're familiar with, that are in their environment. But think about what an animal does. I, I mean, if you could become a wolf, you are very strong, you're very fast, you're powerful. Um, those are all qualities that if you were going to improve yourself as a human being, wouldn't it be great if you could be faster and stronger and more powerful? It makes sense to me that you would, that you would shift into some kind of an animal like that. You rarely hear somebody shifting into, you know, a turtle. 
I mean, they could, but you don't hear that so much. It, it's usually some animal. Well, a, even a, a, a tadpole is a shapeshifter. Yeah, well, yeah. That's, there you go, right? Tadpole the frog, exactly. Um, but you know what's happening? It's interesting because I'm noticing more now in some of the literature and even in some movies, uh, there is shapeshifting into inanimate objects. And actually, if you look at Japanese culture and start reading some Japanese uh, ghost stories, in Japanese culture, uh, so many of their ghosts are also shapeshifters, which we don't really have that in Western you know, ghost culture. They're ghosts. That's what they are. But Japanese ghosts, a lot of them are shapeshifters. And they'll shapeshift into, frequently into inanimate objects rather than animals. Um, so it's kind of an interesting take, and it's uh, you know, a whole different cultural thing. But it just goes to my point that I think shapeshifting can be into anything. And depending on what culture you are immersed in, it, the shapeshifting form will, will be different. You know, it'll depend, I think, a lot on your culture and your environment and what you believe. In the book, Shapeshifters, where can you get it? You can get it anywhere, any bookstore for the most part. Um, you can certainly get it online through Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, you can get it directly through my website. Um, so it's, it's available. Super, and we've got the website linked up. John, thank you. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.